who is, but it says it's love. That's interesting. Let's see. Good morning, friends. Wasn't sure that we were live there for a second, but it appears we are live now. So, hey, happy Monday. Um, big happy birthday shout out to a couple people today. It is Miss Linda's birthday that joins us for chapel every day. We love you, Miss Linda. Happy birthday. I hope your day is fantastic. Um, happy birthday to Greenlee Reef. My girl's 17 today. So, happy birthday, Greenlee. I know she's not going to watch, but her siblings are. And so, um, y'all tell her we gave her a shout out on chapel. All right, so let's get started with our pledges. Let's see. Make sure you put your prayer request in the comments, right? Because we're going to be praying in just a minute. Got a special guest coming in today. You're going to be excited. So everybody's standing nice and tall. Make sure you send me a hello in the comments so I know that you're watching live. You ready? Attention. Oh, no slouching. Stand up. Come on. Attention. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job, guys. All right. Good morning, Juliana and Colleen. Oh, and there's the trips. Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. All right. Christian flag. Everybody standing nice and tall. Sully, shoulders back, buddy. Come on. Attention. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Good job. And now, B I B L E. Here we go. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Get them on your shoulders, because I know you brought your Bibles to chapel, right? Here we go. Get them on your shoulders. Let's go. <coughs> Clear the frogs out. Come on. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E spells... Bible. Good job. Good job. Um, all right. Uh, don't sit down yet because we're going to sing. Um, oh, Miss Linda just chimed in. Miss Linda, we just wished you happy birthday. Hey, let's sing to Miss Linda. Can we sing? Come on. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Linda. Here's your cake. Happy birthday to you. We love you, Miss Linda. All right. Hey, great news. You know, Juliana and Colleen that come to chapel, their mom and dad are teaching a Bible study group on Sunday mornings now. We are so excited to have Miss Melissa and Mr. Walt. So, hey, if you are a kindergartner, you need to come on to Bible study group so you can be in their class because they, they made cross necklaces yesterday. So cool. So cool. So come and join them. All right. Okay, so let's see. We did our pledges. This is the day. Come on. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Look who's with us today. Say hey, Adrian. Hello. And who is your friend here? Kagan. Kagan. Really? Oh, my goodness. Oh, Kanga, that is such good news. Oh, you don't say. Oh, my, can I tell them? Okay, all right, so Kanga is so excited about 2022, and Kanga, you just started a new reading plan? Yeah, and she's reading in Genesis, and now tell me, are you reading it to your bunny friend here? Oh my, what a good friend! 
I am so proud of you for sharing the good news of Jesus with your friend. That is so sweet, Kanga. Oh my goodness. Thank you for being a good friend. All right, you go sit and listen to our Bible story now, okay? Adrian, thank you for bringing Kanga for us today. Don't step on the cords when you go out. Be careful. Wasn't that so nice of Adrian to bring Kanga? Oh my goodness. I'm so thankful they were here. Just so thankful. All right, so let's get started with the days of the week. Because we got to do our calendar, right? Otherwise, Miss Kim would go on all day going, what day is today? What day is today? I need us to do our calendar. Because you know I'm getting up. Y'all know I'm half a century this month. Did y'all know that? This month, I'm going to be half a century. It's crazy. Right, Miss Linda? Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Days of the week. 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 There's Sunday and there's Monday. There's Tuesday and there's Wednesday. There's Thursday and there's Friday. There's even Saturday. Days of the week. 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 All right. So now, right here is where we are. We need to count. Are you ready? Come on, guys. Count with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's right. We need a ten. We need a double digit. A double digit. Woo! -hoo. Here we go. There's our double digit. So it is Monday, January 10th. What's our year? 2022. Woohoo! Good job. All right, so over here, our days of the week. Today is Monday. Now, if today is Monday, what is tomorrow? Tuesday. That's right. Good job, guys. Way to pay attention. All right, and if today is Monday, what was yesterday? <gasps> Sunday. That's right. It was Sunday. We had such a good time in kids' worship yesterday, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Learning all about the Ten Commandments. Remember the first one? Yay, God. No idols. Remember, we learned all those yesterday. Such a good time. All right. Let's see. We're going to continue learning those in kids' worship for the next, I think, 11 weeks. We're focusing on the Ten Commandments. It's going to be amazing. Um, number one, go God. All right. So, let's see. We've done the calendar. Oh, weather. Hold on. The girls sent me a message. Let's see. What did you girls say? Cloudy and cold. So we're going to take down the sunny, right? And we're going to put up our cloudy sign. Cloudy and cold. And are we still in winter? We are. You're right. We're still in winter. All right. So let's see. Let's go straight into our devotion after we pray. We need to pray. Did anybody, let me see, did anybody have prayer request? Oh, oh, Mr. Ken's woohooing because his, his, oh, there's Miss Maudie. Miss Maudie, I hope you're feeling better today. I do indeed. And Miss Linda, I hope you're feeling better today. Uh, got a bunch of people to pray for. A bunch of people are sick. Got a whole bunch of people sick. Got a bunch of people having surgeries. Yeah. So let's go ahead and get our hands up and pray. Ready? One little, two little, three little fingers. Four little, five little, six little fingers. Seven little, eight little, nine little fingers. Ten little fingers. Hold it in prayer. Dear God, thank you so, so much for this day. Lord, thank you for always providing what we need. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I am enjoying reading in Genesis. And, and Lord, I hope my other friends are that are reading in Genesis. And Lord, I just thank you so much for your creation, all your animals and, and all of the trees and the flowers and the ocean and the mountains and all the things that you have blessed us to be able to enjoy. Lord, I, I thank you today for Miss Linda and for Greenlee and uh, all those who are celebrating birthdays, Lord. I just thank you so much for them and what they mean to us. And, and Lord, I pray for those that are sick. Lord, I ask for quick healing for them. Um, Lord, I, I pray for those who are waiting for answers, Lord, that they will get answers soon. I pray for our doctors and our nurses who are caring for those who are struggling. Lord, give them the endurance they need and the wisdom that they need, Lord, your wisdom to be able to help people the best way that they can. Lord, bless our time together today as we dig into your word. We love you and we thank you, Lord, and it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are going to be reading in our I Am devotion today. Mm -hmm. So remember when we were together last time, God created the world, and it was good. And then he created man, and it was real good, right? 
Okay, so today, God of Truth. So the the name for God of Truth is El. Everybody say El. Mm-hmm. Emet. Emet. Can you say Emet? El Emet. Okay, that is God of Truth. That's a name for God. And this this devotion, well, it's kind of sad, really. It's called A Sad Day in the Garden. Can you see that? Hmm. I bet we know why it was a sad day, don't we? Isaiah 65, 16 says, Whoever asks for a blessing in the land will be blessed by the God of truth. So from Genesis chapters 2 and 3, that's where our devotion comes from today, it says, A clear, clean river rippled through Eden. Now, let me pause for a minute. I'm not reading straight from the scripture. This is a devotion summary, right? But if you want to read, and I hope you will, straight from the scripture, this is Genesis chapters 2 and 3. A clear, clean river rippled through Eden, the beautiful garden where Adam and Eve lived with God. In the center of the garden stood two special trees. How many special trees? Two. One, two, right? And the tree of knowing good and evil and the tree of life. That was the two trees. The river flowed through the garden, watering all the plants and all the trees, giving them exactly what they needed. You may eat from every tree in the garden except, except the tree of knowing good and evil, God told Adam. Do not eat from that tree or you will die. That sounds like a pretty clear instruction, doesn't it? Now, God, you know, there's this enemy to God and to us, right? And that enemy did not like Adam and Eve and that they were following God. So one day, the enemy came to Eve disguised as a sneaky little snake. A very sneaky, sneaky snake. We did an SBA song about that one time. Y'all remember that? Sin messed everything up, everything up. Oh, no. Remember that song from SBA? He was a sneaky little snake in a sneaky little way. Mm, Yeah. Did God really tell you not to eat from any tree in the garden? The snake asked. Look at him. Look at him being all sneaky. No, Eve answered. God said we can eat from any tree except the tree in the middle of the garden. If we eat from it, we will die. (laughs) He won't die, lied the snake. Did you hear me say lied? He was a lion, still is, lying, sneaky, horrible. You'll be like God. You'll know about good and evil. That's all. Mean old snake. Well, you know what? Eve listened to that snake and she gazed at that fruit on the tree. Mm. Mm, that fruit looks so good. It looks so good. Oh, and it's so pretty. And and it can make me as wise as God. (gasps) You know what she did? It's terrible, y'all. She decided to believe that old sneaky lion snake. She believed what he said instead of what God told her. Now, what is truth? God is truth, right? God always tells us the truth. She chose to listen to that sneaky old snake in his lies. So she reached for a piece of the fruit and she took a bite. Then she said, Adam, oh, Adam, here, it's so good. Have some. He ate the fruit too. Mm. They chewed it up. They swallowed it, and then they looked at each other, and you know what they said? We've made a big mistake! We should have believed God's words. They wanted to hide. Later in the day, when they heard God walking in the garden, because remember, in the Garden of Eden, they were walking with God, like in his presence, right? You know what they did? They ran away. But God knew where they were, you see, because God knows everything. Can we hide from God? 
Never. He knew what they had done. So he called them and he asked, Did you do what I told you not to do? Eve gave me the fruit and I ate it, Adam said. Of course, throwing Eve right on under the struggle bus, right? The snake lied to me about the fruit and I ate it, Eve said. So let's see now. When we do something that God tells us we shouldn't do, or when we don't do something that God tells us we should do, what, what is that called? Anything we say, think, or do that is not pleasing to God is called a what? A sin. That's right. And Satan wants us to sin. He wants us to be against God. And that's exactly what he tricked them into doing. Oh, he's a lies. Oh, such a liar. So because Adam and Eve had disobeyed God, they could no longer live in that beautiful garden. They could no longer live in the presence of God. Someday, they would die. God's words were true because God cannot lie. You have done what I told you not to do, God said, and now you must leave this beautiful garden. Oh, God punished that old sneaky snake too. He said, you will crawl on your belly from now on. But let me ask you this. Did God stop loving Adam and Eve? Oh, no. God still loved Adam and Eve. He made new clothes for them before they left the garden. And he had a plan ready. See, he already had a plan. Because did God know what was going to happen? See, nothing surprises God. Nothing. And he knew what was going to happen. One day, he would send someone, that's someone with a capital S, because every time we refer to Jesus, it's with a capital letter, right? He would send someone to make things right again. So now, what does all this mean? Let's talk about what it means. You see, some games and toys use play money that doesn't look real, right? Like Monopoly or some of your board games that has pretend money. If you want to buy something at the store, can you use that play money? Well, no, they would laugh at you and say, we can't take that money. You need real money. But look, some fake, some fake money looks really real. And people may try to use it and they might get away with it. Stores need to know if money is real or fake. So cashiers practice feeling of real dollar bills. They learn about the smell. By the way, it's kind of smelly. They learn about the small special markings on the real dollars. And when they recognize real money, then they can spot fake money too, because it's different. One of God's names is God of truth. In the Bible, God tells us what is real and true, right? The Bible tells us everything that's true. The world tells us all these things that are lies and are not true. The Bible tells us truth. That's right. He tells us what's true about himself and about people and about the world. When we know and believe God's words, which are true, then you know what we can do? Just like those cashiers, we can recognize what is not real. We can recognize what is fake because they're different. See, truth and fake, they're not the same. They are different. But here's the thing. Somebody, like Satan, old sneaky snake, if you, if you don't know in your heart, if you're not listening to God's word, then he can make you believe something that's not true, right? Mm. So just like that fake money and the real money and the cashiers knowing the difference, we need to know God's word. We need to know the truth. That's why it's so important that we read his word every day. So we know what his word says. So when some, a lie or something fake comes along, we're like, mm -mm, no, that is not what God said, right? What God says is always true. The God of truth never lies. In fact, he can't lie. His words always prove true. And it tells us that in Proverbs 30, verse 5. Now, Hebrews 6, 18 also says, it is impossible for God to lie. It is. So, we need to know what he says, right? 
We know him more by spending time with him in prayer and by spending time in his word and getting to know him better. That's why it's so important. When Miss Kim says, read your Bible every day, or your mama says, read your Bible every day, it's not because we want you to have busy work. It's because we want you to know God. It's so important. So important. So, you want a sneak peek on what's going to happen Wednesday in chapel? All right. People on earth disobeyed God more and more, but one man, Noah, oh, he was faithful. God saved Noah, his family, and every kind of animal from a big flood. Many years passed until one day God spoke to another faithful man, Abraham. So, if you want to come back on Wednesday, you can see what that's all about. Now, here's Adam and Eve. There they are, leaving the garden. See the animals saying bye because they had to leave. So sad. Mm. If they had just listened, right? How many times have you heard your mama say, what did you just do? And you know, she knows what you did, right? You know that she already knows. But then she asks you, what did you, kind of like God said to Adam and Eve. Did you eat from that tree? Why, why do you think he asked them? Why do you think your mom asked you? What did you just do? Even though we know she knows what we just did. Why do you think she does that? Because she wants to know if you're going to tell her the truth, right? Yeah, she wants to know if you're going to own up to what you did. Kind of like when God asked Adam and Eve, what, what have you done? What did you do? Mm. So, you know, yesterday in kids' worship, we were talking about how when we tell a lie, it just makes things worse, right? Because even if we do something wrong, we might get in trouble for it, but that trouble is way better than double trouble, right? Because if we do something wrong and then we lie about it, oh my goodness, when mama finds out we did wrong and we lied, double trouble, right? It's better to always tell the truth. Just tell the truth. If you make a mistake, just tell the truth and say, I was wrong. I messed up. Please forgive me. Ask mama to forgive you or daddy to forgive you. Ask Jesus to forgive you. And you know, he instantly forgives you when you ask him, right? That's why he died on the cross for us because he paid the price for our sins. And so trust. You know, that's my word for this year, right? Trust. Trust him. Tell the truth and trust him and he's going to help you through even when we make mistakes. Because of that word grace. You know that word grace? He has grace. And he extends grace when we mess up. But we need to not try to hide from it like Adam and Eve hid in the garden. That never works out good. Don't hide from it. Just say, hey, I'm so sorry and I messed up, right? Because I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you, hear these words of wisdom. If you do something wrong and then you lie about it, it's going to be double trouble. And you know what else happens sometimes? Is one time we lie. Then we end up lying again because we want to cover up that lie. And then we lie again because we want to cover up that lie. And it becomes this big old pile of lies. And then when somebody finds out, oh, it's real bad. Because when we mess up and make mistakes, does it only affect us? Mm -mm. It affects everybody around us. Just like with Adam and Eve. Did their sin only affect them? No. <laughs> It affected all of us all these years later. We're still dealing with the sin that started in the garden, right? So it's just better to obey, wait on God's timing, trust God's plan, and obey. Wait, trust, obey. If we do those two, three things, man, a lot. We can obey those Ten Commandments without a problem. We really can. Wait, trust, obey. Yeah, so there's a lot of wisdom in that lesson for today. You love God's Word, don't you? Yeah, so don't lie. Tell the truth. Don't lie. Don't lie. Just tell the truth. All right, are we ready to move on to our story time for Narnia? All right, I'm going to get a sip of coffee. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, we are in C.S. Lewis's The Horse and His Boy. The Horse and His Boy? How does that work? Hmm. Not the boy and his horse, but the horse and his boy. Now, remember... Is this a true story like the Bible? No. This is a story that C.S. Lewis made up, and, and it helps us to be able to relate. Now, we only read halfway through this chapter last time because, remember, somebody pulled in, and Bailey was going crazy, and it's a long, long chapter. It's chapter three, At the Gates of Tashbon. So we're going to pick up where we left off. So have you got your listening ears on? You ready to hear your story today? All right, here we go. Everybody get still. Get settled. Get the wiggles gone. Turn and listen to y'all. Here we go. 
Let's see. We both pray and charge you to come hither as speedily as you may, that we may be delighted with your face and speech, and also that you may bring with you the dowry of my wife, which, by reason of my great charges and expenses, I require without delay. And because thou and I are brothers, I assure myself that you will not be angered by the haste of my marriage, which is wholly occasioned by the great love I bear your daughter, and I commit you to the care of all the gods. As soon as I had done this, I rode on in all the haste from Azimbalda, fearing no pursuit and expecting that my father, having received such a letter, would send message to Ahasta or go to him himself. Now remember what's happening here, right? This is the little girl who met um, the little boy in the woods and their horses are both from Narnia, remember? And her her daddy had betrothed her to be married to this like 60-year-old man and she's like, I don't want to marry him. And so she ran away. Yeah. So she's telling him about what happened. Um... And that is the, the pith of my story until this very night when I was chased by lions and met you at the swimming of the salt water. And what happened to the girl, to the one that you drugged? Asked Shasta. Doubtless, she was beaten for sleeping late, said Erebus coolly. But she was a tool and spy in my stepmother's. I'm very glad for leaving her behind and what happened to her. I say... That was hardly fair, said Shasta. I did not do any of these things for the sake of pleasing you, said Erebus. And there's another thing. I don't understand about that story, said Shasta. You're not grown up. I don't believe you're any older than I am. I don't believe you're as old as I am. How could you be getting married at your age? Erebus said nothing, but Bree said at once, Shasta, don't display your ignorance. They're always married at that age in the great Terkin families. Shasta turned very red, though it was hardly list enough for the others to see this. I mean, light enough. I can't read this morning. Light enough for the others to see it. And felt snubbed. Erebus asked Bree for his story. Bree told it, and Shasta thought that he put in a great deal more than he needed about the falls and the bad riding. Because remember how many times he fell off the horse to start with? Bree obviously thought it very funny, but Erebus, well, did not laugh. When Bree had finished, they all went to sleep. Next day, all four of them, Bree, Shasta, and the horses, two horses, two humans, continued their journey together. Shasta thought it had been much pleasanter, if that's a word, when he and Bree were on their own. For now, it was Bree and Erebus who did nearly all the talking. So now the horses are feeling left out. Bree and Erebus, who did nearly all the talking and had left the horses out. That's what I just said, right? Bree had lived a long time in the Callerman and had always been a among Tarkins and Tarkins horses. And so, of course, he knew a great many of the same people and places that Erebus knew. She would always be saying things like, but if you were at the fight of Zalindra, you would have seen my cousin Alamash. And Bree would answer, oh yes, Alamash, he was only captain of the chariots, you know. I don't quite hold the chariots or that kind of horses who draw chariots. That, that's not real cavalry. But he is a worthy nobleman. He filled my nose bag with sugar after the taking of Tibet. Or else, Bree would say, I was down at the lake in Mesreel that summer. And Erebus would say, oh, Mesreel, I had a friend there. La Saraline, Terkina. What a delightful place it is. Those gardens and the valley of a thousand perfumes. Bree was not in the least trying to leave Shasta out of things, though Shasta sometimes nearly thought he was. People who know a lot of the same things can hardly help talking about them. And if you're there, you can hardly help feeling that you're left out of it. When the mayor was rather shy before a great war horse like Bree, and sad, and, and said very little. And Erebus never spoke to Shasta at all, if she could help it. Soon, however, they had more important things to think of. They were getting near Tashban. There were more and larger villages and more people on the roads. Now remember, that might cause them a little problem because this is two kids on two horses riding into this village and if they see all these people, oh, what could happen? 
They now did nearly all their traveling by night and hid as best they could during the day. And at every halt, they argued and argued about what they were to do when they reached Tashban. Everyone had been putting off this difficulty, but now it could not be put off any longer. During these discussions, Erebus became a little, a very little, less unfriendly to Shasta. One usually gets on better with people when one is making plans than when one is talking about nothing in particular. <laughs> Bree said the first thing now to do was to fix a place where they would all promise to meet on the far side of Tashvan, even if, by all ill luck, they got separated in passing the city. He said the best place would be the tombs of the ancient kings on the very edge in the desert. Things <clears throat> like great stone beehives, he said, you can't possibly miss them. And the best of it is that none of the calamarines will go near them because they think the place is haunted by ghouls and they are afraid of it. Erebus asked if it wasn't really haunted by ghouls. But Bree said he was a free Narnian horse and didn't believe in these calamine tales. And then Shasta said he wasn't a calamine either and didn't, draw, didn't care a straw about those old stories and ghouls. This wasn't quite true, but it rather impressed Erebus, though at the moment it annoyed her too. And of course, she said she didn't mind any number of ghouls either. So it was settled that the tombs should be their assembly place on the other side of Tashvan, and everyone felt that they were getting on very well till when Humbly pointed out that the real problem was not where they should go and when they had to go through Tashvan, but how they were to get through it. We'll settle that tomorrow, ma'am, said Bree. Time for sleep now. But it wasn't easy to settle. Erebus's first question was that they should swim across the river below the city during the night and not go into Tashvan at all. But Bree had two reasons against this. One was the river mouth was very wide and it would be far too long a swim for Wynne to do, especially with a rider on her back. He thought it would be too long for himself too, but mm, he said much less about that, you know, because who wants to admit they might not be able to do something, right? The other was that it would be full of shipping, and of course anyone on the deck of the ship who saw two horses swimming past would be almost certain to be inquisitive. Shasta thought they should go up the river above Tashvan and cross it where it was narrower. But Bree explained that there were gardens and pleasure houses on both banks of the river for miles, and there would be Tarkans and Tarkinas living in them and riding on the river. In fact, it would be the most likely place in the world for meeting someone who would recognize Erebus or even himself. We'll have to have a good disguise, said Shasta. Wynn said it looked to her as if the safest thing was to go right through the city itself from the gate to gate because one was less likely to be noticed in the crowd. But she approved of the idea of disguise as well. And she said, both the humans will have to dress in rags and look like peasants or slaves. And all Erebus's armor and our saddles and things must be made into bundles and put on our backs. And the children must pretend to drive us and people will think we're only pack horses. Oh, my dear Wynne, said Erebus rather scornfully, as if anyone could mistake Bree for anything but a war horse, however you disguised him. I should think not indeed, said Bree, snorting and letting his ears go ever so little back. I know it's not a very good plan, said Wynne, but I think it's our only chance, and we haven't been groomed for ages, and, well, we're not looking quite ourselves, at least I'm sure I'm not. I do think if we get well plastered with mud and go along with our heads down as if we're tired and lazy and don't lift our hoofs hardly at all, we might not be noticed. And our tails ought to be cut short, not neatly, you know, kind of all ragged. These horses, oh my goodness. My dear madam, said Bree, have you pictured to yourself how very disagreeable it would be to arrive in Narnia in that condition? He doesn't sound very humble, does he? Hmm. Well, said Wynne humbly. There's the word. She was very sensible mare. The main thing is to get there. She's got a point, don't you think? 
Though nobody much liked it, it was Huynh's plan which had to be adopted in the end. It was a troublesome one and involved a certain amount of what Shasta called stealing and Bree called raiding. One farm lost a few sacks that evening and another lost a coil of rope the next, but some tattered old boys' clothes for Erebus to wear had to be fairly bought and paid for in the village. Shasta returned with them and triumphed just as evening was closing in. The others were waiting for him among the trees at the front of a low range of wooded hills which lay right across their path. Everyone was feeling excited because this was the last hill. When they reached the ridge at the top, they would be looking down on Tashbone. I do wish we were safely past it, muttered Shasta to Wynne. Oh, I do, I do, said Wynne fervently. That night, <clears throat> they wound their way through the woods, up the ridge, by the woodcutter's track. And when they came out of the woods at the top, they could see thousands of lights in the valley down below them. Shasta had no notion of what a great city would be like, and it frightened him. They had their supper, and the children got some sleep, but the horses woke them very early in the morning. The stars were still out, and the grass was terribly cold and wet, but daybreak was just beginning, far to the right across the sea. Erebus went a few steps away into the wood and came back looking odd in her new ragged clothes and carrying her real ones in a bundle. These and her armor and, and shield and um, scimitar and the two saddles and the rest of the horse's fine furnishings were put into sacks. Bree and Wynne had already got themselves as dirty and bed-raggled as they could and it remained to shorten their tails. As the only tool for doing this was Erebus's scimitar, one of the packs had to be undone again in order to get it out, and it was a longish job and rather hurt the horses. My word, said Bree, if I wasn't a talking horse, what a lovely kick in the face I could give you. I thought you were going to cut it, not pull it out. That's what it feels like. Can you imagine this horse talking to them? Oh my goodness. But in spite of the semi-darkness and cold fingers, all was done in the end, and the big packs bound on the horses, the rope halters, which they were now wearing instead of bridles and reins, in the children's hands, and the journey began. Remember, said Bree, keep together if we possibly can. If not, meet at the tombs of the ancient kings, and whoever gets there first must wait for the others. And remember, said Shasta, don't you two horses forget yourselves and start talking whatever happens. Oh my goodness, do you think they're going to make it through without being noticed? I don't know. We'll have to see on Wednesday. So let's look at our Narnia biblical truths for chapter three. Let's see. There's a horse and his boy. One, two, three. All right, chapter three. 1 Corinthians 8.2 says, The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to some of that we were reading about how one horse thought they knew more than the other and one kid thought they knew more than the other? Hmm. It's a valuable, valuable scripture. So here are our biblical parallels. Erebus describes her daring escape from an arranged marriage in a very matter-of-fact way. It doesn't occur to her to think of her behavior in terms of right or wrong. She, knows, she shows no concern for how her actions may affect others or the consequences might result. She will soon learn the truth of Proverbs 21.2. All a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. Hmm. Biblical parallel 2. It becomes clear that Bree is quite full of himself, his accomplishments, his experience, his wisdom, Bree's self-focus makes him insensitive to others' feelings, especially Shasta's. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 warns, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. And 1 Peter 3 8 says, Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Wow. They can learn a lot from that, couldn't they? Mm. All right, parallel number three. In his concern over his appearance, Bree loses sight of what is truly important, reaching their destination. It is when who reminds her companion that the main thing is to get there. In contrast to Bree, Wynne demonstrates the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit 
which is of great worth in God's sight. That's 1 Peter 3, 4. She consistently models a humble heart. Proverbs 11, 2 tells us that with humility comes wisdom. And here's our last parallel. As the chapter closes, all four of the travelers have come to realize the truth of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. Pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Oh, that is such good wisdom. That is such good advice to listen to. Pride only breeds quarrels. Listen, when we are prideful, it's, it's just not going to work out good in our relationships because it's going to breed quarrels, just like the pastor says. Is the Bible true? Yes. And if it's telling us right here that's what pride does, we should be cautious of that, shouldn't we? Just like them in that book. All right, so here's your challenge. You ready? Like when with Erebus, the Bible tells of a time when an animal spoke up and stopped someone from making a terrible mistake. Do you remember this story in the Bible? Hmm. You ready for your hint? You better be paying attention. Numbers chapter 22, verses, one to, uh, verses 21 to 34. Numbers 22, 21 to 34. You can read that story there. There's your hint. So if you go read it and you get somebody to message or video and Marco Polo me or send it in a text or direct message on Facebook, however, if you can tell me what that story was where an animal spoke up to stop someone from doing a terrible thing, then you know I'll send you a prize in the mail, right? Okay, so there's your challenge for today. Now, if you want to read some more scriptures about a humble heart, because you know sometimes we need to be reminded you can find it in Micah 6, 8, Ephesians 4, verse 2, and James chapter 3, verse 13. All of those will lead you to scriptures about having a humble heart, as we all should, okay? So that's our reading for today. Listen, it's been a great chapel time. I love you guys. I'll see you right back here on Wednesday morning. Let me see those kissing hands. Come on. There we go. I love you guys. See you Wednesday. Bye.